um, now live. Uh, welcome to Product Tank. Um, I've got with me Bruce McCarthy, who has recently come down from his visits to New Zealand and Auckland, where he presented at the inaugural Product Aotearoa conference, which was attended by 300 amazing product people, some of who might have been. Anyone get to go? Three people. Three people, okay. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to get out there and do more in the product community. So we'll definitely be doing it next year. 300 people turned up for this conference. First conference we've ever done. It rocked. It was so good. It was amazing. Amazing, right? And not just because of Bruce's input and Rich Murinoff was there as well. We had six local speakers. We ran workshops on the second day. Uh, everyone was really jazzed about it. It just had such a good feeling about it. And I thoroughly recommend you save up, get the budget approved early, and come along next year because it's going to be even bigger and better. Uh, Bruce is going to redo the talk that he did on stakeholder management uh, that, um, that you would have missed out on, apart from the three people who've already seen this. But now's your opportunity to really dig in and ask Bruce some questions that you might not have got to do if you were there in person. Well, and uh, even if you've seen it, there might be a couple of bonus points tonight because we have a little more time than I had True. that day. Yeah. Um, so, Bruce, thank you very much for coming, and uh, I'm going to leave it over to you. Let's do it. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. It's really, it's really good to be here. I'm glad we could put this together. We sort of last minute, um, and I just um, love seeing a bunch of product people turn up. It's great. Makes me feel part of a community. Um, that's why I do this stuff. Uh, and it's also why I'm talking about stakeholder management because I feel like is the sound coming through okay? Uh, I'm, I'm, is yeah. okay? All right. I feel like this is a skill set we all need. Um, it's a skill set we all suffer from if we don't have it and we don't focus on it and we don't develop it. And when I was looking for materials on it, I couldn't find anything. Nothing at all turned up. I teach. Um, courses and workshops on the hard skills of product like road mapping and prioritization and goal setting okrs discovery all this stuff um but none of that is going to help you if you have the perfect plan and no one knows what it is or is aligned with it and can get behind it it's doomed actually that's what i want to open with is a story of a perfectly doomed plan um this is my first product as a product manager and i'm going to tell you just how badly it went um i worked for a little company that was just making its first foray from um packaged software onto the internet so this is the late 90s that's how long ago this is um and i was the product manager in charge of coming up with something we could do on the internet and i was really psyched I did the customer research, I tested the ideas, I tested the pricing, the, the, the pitch, the value prop, everything. I was convinced I had product market fit, but it still was doomed. Um, and I'll tell you what happened. I, what I had designed was, what I still believe is today, was the very first online print shop where you could order marketing campaigns to be printed and mailed for you. Uh, we sold data, the company sold um, marketing data, so you could combine the data with a design and text and get it um, printed and posted for you. Um, and I thought, okay, you know, marketers, we're just, it's going to be one, one button, it's going to be awesome. Um, the product was called Letter Builder, and as you can see, it didn't become a household name. <laughs> it's still the... Um, the, uh, the domain is still for sale. But $944, like that's, that's not nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you drove up the value of the URL a little bit, right? Um, I was convinced that was what we were going to go IPO on, but that did not happen. What, what happened was, um, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Uh, I realized my mistake about two weeks before launching the product. The product was done. It was tested. We were just doing last minute tweaks to get it out the door. And I walked down the hall to talk to the VP of marketing about how we were gonna promote this thing. And before I could get any words out, she said to me, so Bruce, what is your marketing plan? And I was a little puzzled because I thought she was in charge of marketing. Um, 
But it turned out that the company's marketing plan was already set for the year. The budget was set. The um, campaigns were, were, were set. Um, the targets were set. And she had zero interest in my little product that, as far as she knew, had zero revenue, which it did at that point in time. And so she had numbers to hit, and she was already had planned for that. I stumbled out of that meeting to a meeting with the head of sales that went exactly the same. The comp plan was set, the targets were set, the lead generation was in place, and they had zero interest in anything, especially because my product was gonna be lower priced than our core product. It wasn't gonna help them make their numbers super quick, right? I tried to, I tried to pivot, I tried to, uh, song and dance a little bit and I tried to say well it could be an add-on but I was much too late to the game and I figured out that I might have had product market fit but I did not have what I would call organization fit. I had forgotten about marketing and sales and the support team and the finance team, the services I would forgotten about everybody except my little product development team engineers, designers and, and me uh, that's that that was, to me, the prototypical amateur move of forgetting about your stakeholders around, around the business. Um, the, the company um, went on to do well. We didn't go IPA. We got acquired. Uh, IPO. Um, we, uh, we got acquired. Um, I, IPAs are good. <laughs> um, and my friend Clément, who's um, head of product for Fuse in um, France, said, um, hey, you know, a good plan, but with poor understanding from your stakeholders, you're not going to get the results that you're looking for. That's exactly what happened to me. I don't want that to happen to you. So I've developed over time a skill set and kind of a framework around stakeholder management because I felt at that moment, as you can imagine, motivated to figure out the problem and how to handle it. And um, I've actually kind of made a career out of being the product manager that people around the organization know and feel comfortable talking to um, about what's really going on. My job has always been to get out uh, from my desk and talk to other people um, to make things happen. So these are the four parts of the, uh, of the framework. Um, and let's start with the base level of identifying your stakeholders. Who are your stakeholders? Um, I talked to one or two people who um, manage stakeholders outside their organization. Um, I'm primarily thinking of stakeholders inside, like the marketing and sales people I forgot about in my organization. But the same principles apply here, no matter whether your stakeholders are technically inside or outside of your walls, I think. The number one thing is, well, who are these people? Um, you could start with the org chart, but I find that a simple org chart, the official org chart of the company, hides a lot of complexity. I don't know if you can read this in the back, but this this is somebody's cartoon. Mark Walsh from Integration Training um, put this cartoon together about who's jealous of who, had, who has a secret deal, where are the bribes happening, where are the old scores to settle, where's where uh, who's sleeping to, with whom or selling drugs to whom, whose kids are at the same school. All of this stuff is stuff that you may find out over time but it's completely invisible if you just look at the official org chart. The official org chart is also very neat in terms of like authority and hierarchy. And I find that it's completely misleading in that way. I worked for one company where um, I worked for the CEO and as I figured as long as I keep him happy, we're good. He's in charge, right? No, it turned out the CFO who had a really close relationship with the board and who could fund or defund anything at a whim was the real power player in the organization. And until I started going to him about decisions, nothing went my way. Um, so it's, it's important to figure this out. And I developed a little bit of a framework for helping you navigate the real org chart, I would call it. Now, some of you, if you've studied stakeholder management at all, may have seen this, um, this grid mapping influence versus interest. That is influence within the organization, the ability to make something happen or uh, influence someone to make it happen versus interest, like do they care about the same things that I care about? Do they care about my product or not? And naturally you're looking 
to the upper right hand quadrant because it's always the upper right hand quadrant um, for the people who have the highest influence and the highest interest those are your top priority stakeholders and i've sort of given each of these different quadrants a persona first i think the people with both the highest interest in your product success and the ability to influence that are your team your actual team like your engineers, your designers, whoever it, whoever would say I'm on that team is certainly here because they work on this thing every day. So naturally they're interested and can influence it. But I would also say that success comes in enrolling people in these other quadrants on your team, virtually, um, informally. But let's look at what, what some of the other um, others are. People who are impacted by your product decisions uh, those people obviously have some interest, a high level of interest in the results of your product, whether it's useful to them or not, or whether it's a burden to them. Think about your support team, for example, your customer success team. Uh, we're going to get all the phone calls when your product doesn't work as intended. Um, but they may not have a lot of influence. Sometimes support teams have very little influence within the organization. You should nonetheless want some of those people to informally be part of your team to help you avoid causing a lot of disruption on the support team. Similarly, around your organization, there are people who have knowledge that you don't have and could use. Think about specialists like in legal, in the legal department or the regulatory department, um, who may not, again, have a lot of influence in the organization and may be completely uninterested in your product. But they may be able to advise you about what sort of a um, licensing agreement is better than another um, or what the regulations are that really matter for you to comply with and which ones are just there on paper and are not really a big deal um, that won't get you into trouble. And again, you want, you want to circle with those people early so that you don't find out too late that you've designed something that's not going to fly uh, at the last minute. The, uh, the last one is what I would call power players. These are people who may not be very interested in your product, but who, if they don't think it's a priority or think it's just sort of a silly idea, can kill it with just a word in the right person's ear um, or defund it. Like the CFO that I didn't realize I needed to have on my team before I could really count on being able to move forward with something strongly. So those people, I think, are the sort of the hidden, um, hidden uh, landmines if you don't um, if you don't watch out for them. So you might be asking yourself, um, didn't he just name everybody? And I kind of did. That's the bad news. Um, pretty much everybody in your organization or your extended um, market of stakeholders could be a stakeholder. Um, could be could have an influence on the success or failure of what you are about. And it gets better. None of those people work for you. So you can't tell them what to do and have them and expect them to follow just because you said so. You actually have to figure out a way to influence these people. Um, so but if there's all of these stakeholders and you've got to figure out how to be leverage your time the best, you've got to prioritize. You've identified the endless list of stakeholders. How do you decide who to go after first? Well, there's that grid that I told you about. The people in the upper right and maybe the power players um, would be people to prioritize. Let's talk about who the power players are in your organization. You can go to Slido.com and put in this hashtag where you can take a picture of this QR code. And let's see who you think, the what department you believe the power players are in your organizations. People in the back are too far away to uh, get the QR code to work. Yeah, slido.com, hashtag 
I didn't add customers here. That's a good point. Um, I, I always assume customers are a strong stakeholder, or they should be. And here I'm thinking of internally. It's, it feels like customers is too obvious. So let's figure out who the hidden ones are. This, these numbers here with uh, founders and finance at the top, this is similar to what the results I got in Auckland. And I have to tell you that in many cities, people put product management up there, and I always tell them they're lying. <laughs> or no, wishful thinking, that's, that's what I tell them. I tell them it's wishful thinking. Um, because we know, you guys know you're not in charge. And I, I appreciate that about you. Um, some product managers just think they're in charge. Um, and founders suggest, you know, a lot of um, startup e type companies where the founders are still in charge, start, uh, start up, scale up, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's, that's realistic. You have a, uh, I think, realistic picture of, uh, of the power landscape in your organizations. That's good news for you and your stakeholder management. And I think in New Zealand, because proportionately we have probably more smaller companies in our country, yep. then the founders are still very much involved. Uh, so probably we have more influence in that right. stage. Right, makes sense. Although I work with a lot of companies in that exact stage of scale up. They're not quite a startup anymore. They've raised a round or two of money. They've started to hire people. Now they've got 150 people. Um, and they're, they're still the founders are in charge, but it's starting to change a little bit. Um, I, I found that sometimes it can be illusory um, who's really in charge. I worked for this enterprise software company in Boston, and um, I had a really strong relationship with my core team, designers, engineers, documentation people, testers, et cetera. And over time, I developed a really good working relationship with the other similar product teams around the organization. And I sort of made my way around the organization. I, I learned to um, really uh, take advantage of customer relationships. I had a great relationship with the customer support team. I, I began to work with finance, the marketing teams, partners and vendors. We had a whole ecosystem of partners that did implementations for our product. But it was not until I started helping out with sales. I started actually helping close business. It wasn't until then that I got promoted. That was a data point. Now, this company that I worked for, we had 500 employees and 200 plus of them were engineers. And I worked with those engineers every day and I kind of assumed it was an engineering led company. But this made me curious, this fact that it, uh, that sales made a difference in my success within the company. We're going to come back and talk about other clues that I got about the organization. There are a few questions you could ask yourself about who really has the power within the organization. One is, what department did, or function did your CEO work for before they were CEO, either at this company or another company? At my company, the CEO was a former salesperson. Interesting. Which department has the easiest time hiring or getting approval to hire, especially in tough times? Interesting. Which department or people from which department ask you the most pointed, challenging questions when you present your roadmap or your strategy or your demo or whatever you're presenting? I um, made presentations at the sales kickoff every year at this company, and they were the toughest audience. Um, which department rewards people from other departments for helping out at the, at the annual sales dinner where the salespeople get rewards for achieving numbers and overachieving and stuff like that. They would always pick a couple of product managers or support reps to say, thanks for helping out. And it wasn't until late in the game that I ever got one of those because I began to smarten up about who were the power play players in the organization. Which, um, which leaders have a chief something officer instead of a vice president of or a director of in their title? And the last one is, who does the CEO have coffee with in the morning? In this company, the CEO had coffee every single morning with the head of sales operations, who was the person who managed all the contracts and knew the state of play of every deal in the pipeline. 
the case is closed at that point. It's just, it was a sales driven organization. It just took me a while to figure it out. And that's useful for figuring out who you need to influence around the organization. After coming to that realization, I helped out with more sales calls. I got to know the VP of sales very well. Um, and, uh, and we're still friends. The other, the other thing I wanted to talk about is suppose you've identified and prioritized which stakeholders you really need to influence. How do you make a connection with those people? Just walking up to them and, and spitting out your um, talking points is not really going to help you. I find that you've got to make a personal connection with people. And um, I find that if you want to make a personal connection, if you want to have a genuine conversation where you really find out what they're thinking and where they're really willing to listen to what you're thinking, you've got to uh, maximize two factors. And this is my nerdy way of saying you've got to, um, you've got to be personal. Um, the one axis is um, bandwidth. And the other access is, I would call it intimacy. So intimacy is how big is the group that you're in when you're communicating with this stakeholder? If it's just you and me, that's the maximum intimacy one-on-one. -on -one. If it's in a uh, company all hands meeting, that's the opposite. You might have hundreds of people in the room and it's hard to have a real heart to heart conversation in that scenario. The other, other um, access here is bandwidth. What do I mean by bandwidth? I mean, how much information verbal and nonverbal is being exchanged in real time with the other person. So if you think about it, if I write you an email, well, some of what I've written, you may misunderstand or it's subject to interpretation or you have follow-up questions, but you can't ask a follow-up question instantly in the middle of an email. You can send me a note back and I might read it that day or the next day and I might get back to you and our back and forth is, could take days or weeks. I once, um, a team once brought up to me a um, long-standing JIRA ticket, and they wanted my advice on how to resolve the dispute in the ticket. And there was a trail that was months long of conversation in the JIRA ticket, comments and counter comments and questions and answers and counter questions. And I was like, have these people ever gotten in the same room together to talk about it? Uh, and it turned out those people were in the room while we were having the workshop. So I said, well, let's do it now. And they resolved it in five minutes, something that had been going on for five, for, for many months, because they had a high bandwidth conversation in person. When you're in person, the body language comes across the, um, or even if, even if it's Zoom, the tone of voice comes across, the facial expression comes across, the cadence comes across and you get the estimates are, I've read, that something like 70% of our communication is nonverbal. And so that's entirely missing from an email or a Slack or a tweet. So if you really need to have a conversation with somebody, don't send them an email unless it's the to, can we meet up to talk about this? Uh, and even then, I would say, have that conversation on a messaging app, do it on Slack or Teams or WhatsApp or wherever you might be able to find that person in a more synchronous sort of conversation. Oh, what do you want to talk about? Well, you know, and, and have a little back and forth before you settle on when and where and about what in, in real time. Face to face is preferred whenever you can pull it off. Face to face and one on one. Step back to the degree that you have to. But if you start with face to face and you can't arrange that, step back to video. You can't arrange that. Step back to audio. You can't arrange that. Okay, now we're talking text, but let's do WhatsApp, not an email. It's higher bandwidth. It's more synchronous. The other thing I would say is um, a lot of the time you haven't yet made a connection with other people, or at least not a deep one. And um, you've got to try to figure out what's really on their minds because they may not tell you, even if you ask, even if you ask nicely. Um, so what I like to do is to start with some reasonable inferences about what might be on other people's minds based on what I do. And what do we know about our colleagues? We know what job they have. 
We know that they work for the same organization if they're internal, and we know that they're in engineering or marketing or finance or whatever. And so we can guess that they might have certain concerns. What do engineers care about? Working on something cool and technical debt, right? What do marketers care about? Buzzwords and lead generation, right? They, you can guess. Um, now, you don't want to say, uh, you don't want to make fun of your stakeholders. You don't want to you know, say, uh, I'll bet you only care about something that you don't think is really important. But, you know, imagine a conversation where you're sharing your, your roadmap. You can reasonably infer that if you're showing it to a salesperson, they want to know, can I sell this now? Um, will it help me close business? Uh, what, what are you doing about the competition? And as long as we're talking about it, I have five other things I want to see in the room, right? Um, based on conversations I've had this week, because that's my attention span. Um, sorry if anybody is in sales. Um, you can start there. Um, you can reasonably expect that, and you can even prompt people. You can say, so if they don't say anything, you could say, so if, if I were in your shoes, I might be wondering how much can I count on this? Is it going to change or can I sell this? Let's talk about that. And then that gives them the opportunity to say, I'm so glad you said that because yes, that is a concern or no, actually I don't, I don't really care. They can, um, but you've broken the ice on that. They can, and you can clarify the situation because you said it first, you took the chance and, and broke the ice be a completely different conversation with engineering. Do you know how much work this is? Uh, I would never use this stuff. Um, and um, what about the tech debt? And um, you know, can I make a 12 month uh, project plan and architecture diagram and count on you not to change the backlog? Um, similarly, if you're talking to finance, they wanna know what's gonna be the effect on margin. When do we start to make money? Can we reduce the spend on R&D once we do this? All of these things you guys are smiling because you know these are the sorts of things that you know that are on their mind so get it out on the table and let them confirm or deny um, that they're actually concerned about that maybe they'll say no no actually i'm more concerned about and then you've invited them to fill in the end of that sentence and you find out something you didn't know because you got them to say no to this and yes to that instead so start with what you know and then watch and wait for what people say to you. The watch and wait part, the listening part, I think is probably the most critical bit of stakeholder management. I said earlier, don't just walk up and give people your talking points. You want to invite them to tell you what they're concerned about before you tell them anything. I think you earn the right to tell people your thoughts after you listen to theirs. And after they're convinced that you've heard their thoughts, um, that's the two way exchange. So I'm, I'm going to share some techniques with you for listening. Sounds like it uh, simple, right? You stop talking and see if they say something. Well, there's a bunch of things you can do to help move the conversation along without talking, without interrupting them and while inviting them to, to speak. I call these techniques, most of them mirroring. It turns out that people are comfortable with other people that they perceive to be like them. And so if you can give them the impression that you are like them or that you appreciate them or that you're on the same wavelength with them, then they will be more likely to take a chance and share what they're really thinking. So you can do that with posture. If the person in front of you that you're talking to is like super laid back and just like um, chill and they're um, slumping in their seat, well, you can do the same thing. First time I showed this slide to my wife, it turned out we were both sitting exactly the same as mirror images of each other like this, even opposite knees like this. So it really was like a mirror. Um, or you know what, if the, if the person in front of you is just has a really active stance, they're you know like Captain Kirk hands on hips or they've got their arms across like, uh, like this, you can do that too. Be careful that you're not seeming to challenge them uh, if, they're, if they are sensitive to that. It's culturally specific. Um, 
but use your judgment and try to play the role and try to suggest that we're in this together um, with posture. Fronting is also a thing. It conveys that you're paying close attention if you face directly at somebody instead of being like, yeah, I'm busy over here, but what did you want? Um, again, some, some cultures feel that that is confronting if you face directly at somebody, so be careful of that. Um, but within the um, envelope of comfort, clearly try to convey that you are paying attention and that you want to know what they're saying. Eye contact is the same. Different people are, have different levels of comfort with eye contact. And in some cultures, um, uh, uh, Northern European countries, uh, eye contact is expected. In some Asian countries, it's challenging. So just be careful about that. You can also lean forward. Some of these techniques are actually really great on Zoom. You know, you can really just like, really tell me more. I really want to know. And leaning in toward the camera in Zoom makes your face bigger and makes it really obvious that you are facing them and that you are listening. Um, the my favorite though, for especially for a video call, is what what's called the triple nod. This is when you're encouraging someone to continue by saying, "Yeah, uh -huh, okay, I hear you." Yeah. I get it, but you're not making any, you don't have to make any sounds so that it doesn't screw up the, du the duplex on the uh, microphone and they think you're trying to say something when all you're trying to say is, uh-huh. So do the triple knob instead. And especially if you're smiling, it's super encouraging. It basically says, please continue. Doesn't necessarily mean I agree. It says, I acknowledge what you're saying, please continue. And that's, um, if you do that without saying anything, People just feel a sort of a social obligation to fill the, the void there and continue to talk. You can learn a lot about what they're thinking. Punctuation gestures as well. You may have noticed I use my hands a lot. Other people do too, but everybody's hand signals are different. Some people like to point. Some people like to thumbs up a lot. Some people will clap. Um, some people um, will just throw their hands in the air like this. Um, and you can use some of those same punctuation gestures. You can use them while you talk, which gives them the feeling that you're like them. Or you can use them when they talk, which gives you them the feeling that, again, you're acknowledging. It's like the triple knot. If they have a tendency when they're making a point to go like this, like, this is totally obvious, of course. Well, then when they make a really good point, you just do this silently. And they feel like, okay, they get what I'm saying. That acknowledgement is very rewarding for people and it encourages them to continue and encourages them to share what they're really thinking because you are not a threatening audience at all. Um, all of these are um, non-verbal, but there's also some verbal things you can do like word choice. If it's inside your company or inside your industry and there's some buzzwords or jargon or you know every company's got their acronyms, right? use those it it indicates that you're in the same club as that other person if you're talking to somebody from outside that club don't use those words it makes them feel shut out um, use the words that they're comfortable with i do this unconsciously i've been in this country for a week and a half and uh, i've been in a lift not an elevator uh, in my uh, in my hotel and there's lorries out there not trucks um and I just, I just pick up the local vocabulary without meaning to, it just happens. Um, sometimes I even imitate the accent, um, but uh, uh, I haven't got the Kiwi accent quite down yet. Speaking style also. Um, so some people speak really fast and they're from New York and they just really get excited and, it's, and they get really up there in the register and they just keep going like this. And other people, they're like super chill, man and really from California. And so they're going to really be um, casual about everything. And if you, I'm not saying to be inauthentic, I'm saying meet them at least a little bit within their comfort zone. Um, don't be loud if they're soft. Don't be <laughs> super soft if they're loud or fast or slow. Um, I had this, um, this workshop the day after the talk in, um, in Auckland. And we did half a day on these techniques and 
one of the techniques is to use small talk to try to get people to open up to use these techniques while you're using small talk to see if you can find out anything beyond the weather um and um one person was saying oh yeah i had a boss who used to use this conversational seemingly casual uh conversation that then turns into a very serious work conversation um and i hated it because it was super obviously manipulative um and i would encourage you with all of these techniques don't be a cartoon of the other person don't don't give them the impression that you're making fun of them or that you're manipulating them um but a little subtle mirroring as a way of conveying i hear you and i want more it can go a long way there's also that good trick of explicit mirroring what they say to so repeat what they say that's right back to them i call that summarizing yeah. and so somebody goes on for two minutes explaining their point if you can summarize that point in 10 seconds you know that you've got them if they say exactly or yeah that's right or oh you said it better than me uh you bet it shows you've been listening and again you might not agree you might say so what you're saying is or so you feel that words like that just having them acknowledge that or having their thoughts and their feelings acknowledged makes them feel heard and then you can come back and contradict them. You can say, okay, I totally get it, but here's why I disagree. And they're more willing to listen because you listened first. Um, then let's talk about the last step, which is leading, I think. Um, stakeholders um, operate within an organization and you need to understand your organization and how it makes decisions, how you all make decisions collectively. Some organizations, Bain and Company, did this um, two by two grid. Got to have a two by two grid, um, and they they divided organizations in their decision making style into four dominant types. Directive is we're all familiar with this. You said founders are the people who are really in charge. It's um, one or a few people saying this is the plan. Everybody get on board. Any questions? Um, at the other extreme, you have consensus. Consensus is where we keep talking about it round and round until we get everyone to agree. This is the thing that um, Jeff Bezos and, and Amazon have been fighting against when they say, we're not gonna try for consensus, we're just gonna disagree and then commit. We're, even though not everyone agrees, we're going ahead and doing it. Uh, democratic is what it sounds like, there's voting. And within certain organizations, there really can be voting for key decisions. I was talking to someone in Auckland who um, works for the uh, a political um, organization. And he told me that major policy decisions by the Green Party are made by vote internally. No, no, by consensus, right. Um, but then, of course, people decide whether to vote for the Green Party after voting. <laughs> right? So it's both and. Um, and then there's this last one, which is called participative, which is sort of trying to get the best of both worlds. Participative is when one person owns the decision, and it might be one of the founders or it might be uh, somebody else who's appointed to be in charge of a decision like a product manager. Uh, like, you know, the decision might be what goes on the backlog or how does, it, how does it get prioritized. But in the participative one, they are also obligated to seek input from stakeholders. Anyone who's impacted or has good information, like the impacted folks or the subject experts, or if you're smart, the power players on that other two by two grid. Um, but then they make the decision after consulting the necessary people. Um, so that one's a balance. I got another poll for you. Yeah, please. I think the consensus based decision making that we do in the green party is slightly different from how you described it because mm. it's about there is a struggle to gauge where everyone's at yep and then it's the people who disagree who get to speak speak up speak up and explain where they're coming from yeah and then there's another struggle to kind of see yeah you know have we change everyone's mind and explain it a little more and that's so it's, how it's uh, kind of a mix of the yeah okay. i think that's how caucuses work in some yeah. states state primaries in the U.S. with straw polls. 
So what, um, let me see what kind of data we're collecting here. Now you all seem mostly to be saying that you use the participative method, and I think that's wishful thinking. <laughs> If, if, um, if, especially if uh, the power players in your organization are founders, more often than not, they are probably telling you what to do. You can push back, but good luck um, with that. Um, on the other hand, that is the right answer. Bain and company in that same um, framework said that organizations uh, that use the participative style tend to be more successful. They make better decisions and they make them quicker because they are blending the benefits of directiveness. Some, some one person makes the decision with consensus or dem democracy, getting sourcing good ideas and um, downside risks from around the organization. Um, Do you want a mixture, right? Like because at a certain point, the founder and the CEO is going to direct certain behaviors and certain goals yeah. for others to participate in and if they're healthy organization that would delegate some yep. authority to make decisions who really could be participative. Participative. Yeah, you need to change that word because they're coming out. <laughs> yeah, like so you could you could have both right in the organization Actually that's very common is that uh, different decisions are made different ways and that also that organizations evolve over time. Um, you might uh, have a vote about where to hold the holiday party. Um, and you might have a directive decision about, all right, we're going into the Australian market that comes from one of the founders. Um, and that's uh, and that's fine. Um, what you want to understand is what's the dominant sort of default behavior within the organization for important decisions and work within that. And I'd say also that ideally you want to um, try to, when, when decisions are important, when the right answer is important and buy-in is necessary for them to be executed, you want to see what you can do to pull the organization up to this quadrant for those kinds of decisions. So if there's a tendency for it to be top-down, you can talk to the executive in charge of that decision and say, wouldn't you like to know what the marketing team has to say about this opportunity before making a firm decision? Shouldn't we talk to the support team about the problems in this area what does what sales have to say? All right, all right, I won't make a decision instantly. Let's talk to a few people. Or if you're stuck in analysis paralysis and everybody is um, just talking about it and talking about it endlessly, you can try to say, could we assign someone to be in charge of uh, collecting all the information and making a proposal? That's kind of how the participative um, process works ideally, is you say, all right, there's a product manager or somebody in charge of this decision they're going to collect the data and they're going to come back and they're going to make a proposal. And if we all say it's okay, then we're going forward. And if there's still some things to work out, then we'll work them out, which is maybe not too unlike the strong. Right? Okay, we did the, uh, we did the poll. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is how I, I think that stakeholder management, I think that sometimes we make the mistake I think this is sometimes a fundamental product manager mistake or project manager mistake too, of thinking that we are there as, um, as servants of everybody else, that we're there just to collect all the requirements and all the priorities and all the decisions and then make it happen. But I think that's a misunderstanding of the role. I think it's more proactive than that. I think um, it's not about handling requests or approvals or objections. Um, I think it's proactive. This is my favorite Martin Luther King Jr. quote. A genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but a molder of consensus. That's leadership, is um, figuring out what the right answer is and getting people lined up um, behind it. And I, I think that there is a tech world term for this. Has anybody heard this term, the DRI? Well, I uh, talked about it on Thursday. But um, uh, the DRI stands for directly responsible individual. And it's a term that was invented at Apple to describe the point person, the person everybody needs to talk to on a particular project. Um, GitLab adopted it, and it's the person who's in charge of making sure that a project or a product or a whatever is successful. They're accountable for it. 
Um, that doesn't mean that they do it all alone. Uh, I worked in a startup with my dad at one point, and he described this role as being the mother of something. That is, you're in charge of making it sure it happens, but you're not going to do it all by yourself. And also, I'll, I'll close with a story about um, about a guy named Chase Morsey, who, in my mind, was sort of the prototypical DRI and product manager. And he worked for Ford Motor Company in the 1940s. So this is not high tech in any way. Because these things that we're talking about have nothing to do with the tech industry. It's just about operating within an organization. So Chase um, was a product planning guy. Was a, At the time that he joined the company, was a young guy just fresh out of um, being a soldier in World War II. And um, he was just a product, product planner, so like a lot of us. And um, he discovered, to his dismay, a few months into working for the company, that upper management had made the decision to discontinue making the Ford V8 engine. And he knew instinctively that that was the wrong decision. He'd been a Ford guy his whole life, and he knew that part of the core value proposition of the product was the V8 that it had a reputation as being more powerful, more reliable than other engines and even other V8s. And um, so he talked to his boss and he said, this is a really stupid idea. We really should not do that. And he said, look, the bosses are set on this. It's an uphill battle if you want to fight this. And he said, I'm going to fight this. So he went around the organization lining up um, his stakeholders. He first did the very first consumer survey that Ford had ever done. And he asked about why people buy Fords versus Chevys, which were their main competition at the time. And the V8 popped way up in their reasoning for why to buy it. In fact, in some of the interviews, people said, if it doesn't have a V8, I might as well just buy a Chevy. It was, it was really that simple. He talked to the dealers who sell the cars, same story. They were like, you're not really going to do discontinue the V8 because I need to get another job if you are. Um, and then the real problem, though, was that management had decided that the V8 was too expensive and unprofitable. So he got the procurement department to buy a Chevy V8 and take it apart and gave it to finance and asked them to source all of, uh, uh, to price all of the parts. And he discovered that the Chevy V8 was actually more expensive on a parts basis than the Ford V8. And then he talked to the manufacturing team and he found out that they were working on a new method of assembly that would be much faster and more efficient and higher quality. Um, and that with a few tweaks, he worked out how they could make the Ford V8 engine more profitable because they could charge extra, even though there were, it was a longer parts list. Um, than their smaller V6 engine. So he took all of this information and he presented it to the executives. And in a marathon session, they grilled him about all of the data because um, they really did not want to change their minds about this. It was a big, important decision. But um, with every question, some other stakeholder in the room got up and said, no, yeah, we did the numbers with Chase and he's right. And at the end of the day, they had to change their minds because he had done his stakeholder management. He had gotten everybody to line up um, around um, his position because they were part of it, because they contributed to it. They did the survey or talked to the dealers or bought the parts or priced them out or figured out the manufacturing methods. So they were like, well, here's, here's our plan. That's, um, that's my mind, in my mind, the job, is to figure out with your stakeholders what the right plan is, and then you're all gonna execute it um, together. The DRI, like, like Chase, they align on the objectives with the authorities, profitability in that case, align with stakeholders on the metrics, the priorities, the details, review all the available data, seek the best information uh, and advice communicate those decisions and the reasons behind them. And once you're down working on something, actually communicate progress broadly and regularly. Progress and learnings.
and that's the the whole um, that's the whole framework. Um, identify the stakeholders, prioritize them, get to understand them, and then lead them in the direction that makes sense as a team. Um, we'll um, we'll take uh, questions in a second. I have one slide of um, commercial. Um, I'm working on a book on this topic on stakeholder management it is called Aligned Stakeholder Management for Product Leaders. I'm working on it with a woman named Melissa Appel, who I've worked with for years, who used to work at Wayfair, a large furniture retailer with a team of 300 product managers. Um, so she had a lot of stakeholders to manage. Um, and this QR code will take you to our early readers club uh, where you can sign up there is a monthly fee um but the early readers club it has become uh two things one is you get access to the drafts of the book as we are writing it and you can give your feedback and comments we've had some really useful comments we do have a first full draft at this point and we're working on a rewrite based on all the great feedback that we've gotten from people we will not we're not handing the book in for another four months so there's still a lot of rewrite to be done um, and I would love your anecdotes and, uh, and comments on it to make it the best book it can be. Um, and then the other thing it's turned into is kind of a group support um, uh, forum. We meet every month on Zoom um, in what is in the Boston area um, the afternoon, so it'll be morning here. Uh, and we talk about everybody's stakeholder management challenges usually get between eight and 12 people on a, in a session and somebody will say, yeah, I've got this problem with my boss. Can anybody give me some advice? And it's really, um, really been great. And then uh, the last thing is I do also have an online course um, on product roadmaps from my last book. Um, if you're interested in that, that's completely self-paced. Um, it's got a series of videos. Uh, that walk you through creating a terrific roadmap. There's a PowerPoint template and um, a bunch of exercises. So if you're interested in that, that's the other QR code. And that's all I have. Questions? So the DRI is like, I guess, the definition of product leader, right? Kind of is. I mean, if you think about it, it sure sounds like a product manager, doesn't it? Um, but they, um, I think product managers do something subtly different at Apple. And the DRI could be at someone in charge of design, it might be at Apple, or a program manager that might be at Microsoft. Um, it's whoever is the point person. The so one. At Google, a lot of DRIs would be engineers. Did you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think it's a, a step I mentioned this way for up. I think it is a part of the core competency of what you get there and also a responsibility of the company to have a distribution of that. So, so like sales and marketing, they misalign with the product manager building a product. That's a bad of the product manager. So it needs to be like, what in the start? So we're figuring out the opportunities. Yeah. As a commercial buyer, the opportunity. Agreed. So you're you're diagnosing my failure in that initial story. Um, to be fair, the company was was changing directions in the middle of my um, product development effort, but I screwed up. I really did. Um, he was saying, in case you couldn't hear, he was saying he thinks stakeholder management is. Um, Baseline skills for any PM and being misaligned around your organization is a fail. You've just got to manage it. Was there a question? Yeah, just a comment. Just a comment. Okay. All right. I'm glad we agree. You learned the lesson probably faster than I did. Um, so coming back to that paper chart, um, you know, Oh yeah. If I am not a correct leader, but I want to become one, I want to say or management. How can I navigate that without just stepping over my manager? Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, some people are much more uh, sensitive to hierarchy. 
Oh yeah. The, the question was, if I want to get ahead in the organization, if I want to move up the org chart, how can I um, do that? How can I manage the stakeholders at a higher level without making my manager feel like I'm going around them? And um, some people are more sensitive to that than others. Some people will be happy, um, especially if you share with them that you want executive exposure because someday you want to be promoted um, and not find that threatening at all and want to support you. That I would hope for a boss like that. Um, but some of them are really not comfortable with that. Um, I've worked, I had um, had a boss where our mutual boss, two levels above, had said to me very clearly, I need you to work directly with me. I don't want you to distract your boss with the stuff that you're working on because I've got other thing, other priorities for him. And I was like, great, okay, fine. And then my actual boss came to me and said, what the fuck? You're going around me. Um, this is a problem. And I said, okay, yes, this is a problem. You and I have the same problem, our mutual boss. He's not being clear between you and me. Um, and we made common cause about that um, to manage that situation. And um, that worked out really well. And um, actually, I'm still really good friends with my former boss and not so much with the guy two levels a month. Um, so you, it's, a, it's a little bit squishy. You've got to figure it out a little bit with the personalities involved, I think. But you can usually find good, uh, good reasons why the success of the product requires you to reach out around the organization and to reach out to the people who really can influence things, to the power players, ignoring the hierarchy in the in in the stakeholder uh, in the org chart. I honestly think when you're thinking about who do you need to influence to make your product successful, the org chart is just complete junk. Just ignore it. Just figure out who can have a positive or a negative effect on my on my product. Those people are on the list, and everything else is lip service. I think if you have to make the case directly to your boss. Do that. If that's helpful. Yeah. Basically, if you're new to the organization, say you're at the new what's the strategy then to try to break the Right. To get access to So the question was if you're new to the organization, maybe all you have is the org chart. Um, so where do you start and how do you uh, break through to those connections? I would say. Yeah, you've got to start with the org chart. Start with your own boss. And with every conversation you have, you want to end the conversation with who else should I be talking to? Who else would might in, might have good information or input for my plan? The stance you want to take when you're talking to any stakeholder is you want to sort of transmit that you assume that this is the participative style within this organization, even if you know that it may be not quite right all the time, and say, I have this decision to make. I have to put together a plan or a roadmap or whatever, and I need your help. I could really use your advice. What input do you have for me? What would you do in my shoes? People are really flattered to be asked. And so they really do try to enter into a problem solving mode. Now, of course, they also have their own personal or professional interests, so you have to take that into account. And that's why you talk to multiple stakeholders to balance those concerns. But just putting them in that, in that frame of mind also gives you permission to say, I'm still working on my plan, who else should I be talking to? And they'll tell you, yeah, okay, officially, you need the approval of XYZ in accounting, but the person you really need to talk to is and then you get to see beyond the, uh, the org chart. They'll give you much more of that advice if you also do the active listening and let them talk. If you also, I didn't mention this um, uh, today, but in the workshop we cover trying to uncover common interests. Um, one of the things you can do just by talking about the weather is to find out why hot weather or cold weather or whatever weather is good or bad for that other person and make a connection on that. Oh, you'd like to go hiking. I like to go fishing. Those are both outdoor things. We both like that. Um, now we have something in common. We are outdoor buds. Um, and um, 
now I'm more of a human being, and so are you in this conversation, not just a faceless stakeholder. Yeah, question. So, sort of related to what you just saying, I think of um, stakeholder management as being underpinned by relationship. Yeah. And years ago, I got given how to win friends and influence people. Right, right, right. Which is used as a throwaway to a lot. But I read it, and I, and I don't read it. Um, Books, Be, kind of because you're right, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was saying uh, how to win friends and influence people influenced him, and I think that's right. I haven't actually read the book, but I but I've seen you know the, the the nine principles or whatever that comes out of the book, and I think what we are doing here when we are managing stakeholders is we are hacking the friendship wiring in ourselves and the other people, and turning stakeholders into friends you know work friends they may be not your best friend ever but you do come to trust and rely on each other like real friends um the thing you also want to do though is make sure that they don't mistake that you're trying to hack some other wiring um like that you're coming onto them um I, when we were writing writing this book um i wrote a chapter on making connections and it was a lot of my advice was like figure out a, a time and place to invite somebody out for coffee or a beer after work or lunch or whatever and my co-author melissa said yeah some of that as a woman i would not be a hundred percent comfortable with asking a colleague especially a single colleague out for a drink maybe not um so i think it's context specific and you just want to make sure it's clear what your intentions are um but you know most people are happy to um be friends right they'd rather do that than be constantly feeling like um you're working across purposes if not best friends at least not both. right <laughs> right um I, and i think some people sort of think in a binary fashion if you're not a friend then you are a foe so let's make sure the category is correct have you got advice for when the common stakeholders are yours? You may have built up a relationship with them, but they're still going, like the classic case the founder goes and talks to the engineer. Yeah. Like, have you got any advice for confronting your stakeholders, say, just like stop founder, talking to, stop yeah, talking stop to the talking engineer? To people who you think you can yeah, that's a tough one. You, it is a rare product manager that can stop a founder from doing it. <laughs> or a salesperson, or it could be any number of people. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of techniques you can use. One is, um, like in chess, you use a, you use another piece as um, as a distraction. Um, so you can, if if you have a good relationship with your boss, who maybe is on the executive team, they may have an easier time influencing the behavior of the founder and saying, "Look, you're you're messing in my backyard." Um, and I need you to not do that. Um, we have we have a process, and let's follow it. Well, the process is too slow. All right, let's work on speeding it up, but let's not go around it. Now, it still may happen. It still will happen. So the other half of it is you talk to the engineers, and you get them and their boss to turn the founder back and say, yeah, I'm happy to work on that for you, Go talk to the product manager. Um, so you gotta you gotta sort of surround that founder with the uh, with the head of engineering and the head of product, your boss, um, and anybody else who you can line up, and um, eventually they'll get the message. Or um, now, uh, just I, I don't want to make any promises, but I've been close to a few CEOs who were replaced because at a certain point they were holding back the scaling of the organization with this kind of behavior. Yeah, question. The intimacy and bandwidth slide is like, quite a lot of things, like based on the speed. Which slide? Um, the intimacy and bandwidth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Video call, face-to-face versus like, is it? Um, currently, I'm navigating a scenario I've worked where um, our MCs have not busy, but there's said to be the expectation that we um, try to copy some spots and maybe to the execs, keep them in the loop. And we also have Slack channels, we also have script reviews, we try to like, 
hit me in that because it's more of what's going on. Uh, so, but then they don't turn up to those meetings. Yes. And then and then they're then they're like, what are you guys even doing? Yeah. So that's um, that's one of the problems that we had, and the others. Um, I think the leaders really think for each of the uh, quite over two days as well as to um, have regular uh, all night little like meetings. What's this meeting was like? I'm like, from the meeting to the meeting, it feels like um, you're quite happy with communication, although you're a little, a little, a little bit nervous about the face to face time here. Uh, how would you navigate this scenario? The scenario is that the executive sponsor wants more face time but doesn't make time for it? I think it's too much. So why does this um, they come out to team the team so they don't? They actually want some videos and articles to be which is actually quite cool that they do engage. But at the same time, I feel like um, they are already quite meet to be equal. And yes. to put another meeting into their yes. calendar, yes. So like, is that really good piece of time? This is, um, this is an important technique so that if I understood your question correctly, this is me summarizing. Um, it can be really hard to get on the calendar of your stakeholders, especially if they are executives. And yet you need to manage that relationship and you really want to do it one on one if you can. So how are you supposed to do that? Uh, you, you end up defaulting to an email summary and that just doesn't work as well as we discussed. Um, so a couple of techniques have really worked well for me. My favorite technique is to go into the office when you think they will be there and hang around by the coffee machine. Get your laptop, do your work at the coffee machine. Eventually everybody comes by the coffee machine, right? Or the tea or something. Um, and then have an informal chat. In fact, I think informal chats are much more effective. It's like what's called the hallway conversation, right? Much more effective than a formal meeting. There's no agenda. You're just like, I just need two minutes because there's this thing and I really need your input. Um, and people, again, are flattered to be asked. And if they've got enough time to make coffee, they've got two minutes to talk to you, right? Um, same thing is you can keep an eye on their office and see when they might be free and just pop your head in their office, their desk, whatever it is. Um, I had a CFO, the same CFO I was mentioning earlier, who it turned out was really in charge. And he was really antisocial as well. So he was hard to influence. I think he knew that uh, people would try to influence him and he didn't want to be bothered. So he left the office at three in the afternoon and he frequently had his door shut and there was no window. So I couldn't see if he was busy or not. Um, but I figured out that in order to compensate for leaving at three in the afternoon, afternoon he showed up at 7 a.m. every day when no one else was in the office, which was perfect. If, if I really needed his attention, I would show up. Well, I, uh, I've been saying turn up because that's more Kiwi and I say show up in America. Um, so I, I would turn up and um, no one else would be in the office but me and him and he couldn't avoid me. <laughs> yeah, right. So you've got to find uh, some way of informally being in this person's presence. Um, like you've got to find another excuse to be in that other office um, or figure out when they might be visiting your office or um, are we talking different cities, the different offices? Yeah, yeah that's tough, right? Um, you can also try, uh, when you said you use Slack, Slack is at least a little less formal than an email summary, right? And you can, when you write something in Slack to somebody, you want to try to start a conversation. So don't information dump them like you would in an email. Just say, um, I need your input on X, Y, Z and wait for them to say, okay, what questions do you have? And then ask them one question, get an answer to that and then ask them the next question. Um, people, first of all, can't really process seven questions all at once anyway. So, and it makes it more of a conversation. The other thing you can do is you can message them and you can say, I just have a quick question. Can we get on Zoom for two minutes? Now, or, you know, Slack has video, right? So just do that. Um, people having a formal meeting is A, hard to arrange and B, not as effective. Um, and C, uh, takes longer to get on the schedule as well. The last uh, one, if you're really desperate, um, 
we have this story in the book that came from one of our early reader club um, discussions. Uh, this one product manager said, yeah, um, I really needed the input of this one director and he was ducking me. Um, and um, I, but the deadline was looming and I needed his input. So um, I knew when he walked to the train from the office at the end of the day and I met him at the door and I said, I know this is really weird and I'm sorry, but I really need your input on this. I'm going to walk with you to the train if that's okay. And the, the guy was caught completely off guard and just said, okay, sure. And they walked to the train and he got the input that he needed. And then he walked back to the office to get his car <laughs> because uh, he wasn't taking the train. Um, so if you're really like self-deprecating and transparent and funny about being weird and doing your job as a, as a stakeholder manager, sometimes people are just disarmed by your honesty about your, your motive. Your motivation isn't personal. It's for the company. Um, so I think people appreciate that. So that gives you the opportunity to do what? Yep. Yep. Any other questions or we were out of time? We're out of time. Okay. Thank you so much. This was fun. Thanks, Bruce. And thanks everyone for coming. And thanks to those people online who may have just been me. Didn't cut me off. Oh, good. Thanks everyone online. I appreciate you being there and we'll see you next month.